Well, first, uh, um, I'm from Midwest, so I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> and, um, first, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for the meeting, um, Professor Sori and Professor Trublad and Professor Marin for inviting me here. I'm very honored. So, so I'm, well, my talk is the first, and uh, in this talk, um, I would like to give a um, very intuitive like, motivation about why we're doing this and uh, a very concrete example that shows some use utility of using a um, quantum model for modeling cognition. So my talk is all organized in this way, some motivations, um, and a model, what I, I call quantum model for question order effects, QQ model, and then some new empirical test for this model, and finally some comments. So why quantum model? So human cognition and behavior is both probabilistic and uh, dynamic. There are two ways to build such a system, um, classical probability dynamics of quantum and some more generalized probability theory too. So previous the work has done primarily in social and behavior science is based on classical systems. And we want to explore in this meeting some other ways. So classical probability theory um, was developed over several centuries, eventually arising from the um, trying to solve the problem in physics, and then later used in economics, finance, statistics. And it's not until 1933, um, Komogorov has the book and finally set up uh, an axiomatic foundation for the classical probability. So basically, um, classical probability theory is based on the premise that events are represented as subsets of a large set called the sample space. So we use the additive measure to assign probability to events. And uh, this entails a logic, the logic of the subsets, which is a Boolean logic. So this has some very strict laws, such as uh, commutative laws. So um, I think later at four, Jennifer and will have more intro introduction on those general difference. So but is this the only way to think about events and probabilities? So there's a quantum probability theory coming into the picture. So the theory was developed in the 20s by a group of brilliant um, physicists. This is uh, the picture from the 1927 Solvay conference. And uh, so this has revolutionized our world by giving us a transist, a laser, and foundation for chemistry, among many, many other accomplishments. And I think there was some estimation about one third of the world economy is directly, directly driven by quantum physics, quantum mechanics right now. And in 1930s, then one Norman um, had a book called uh, Quantum Logic and Quantum Probability, which is set as the axiomatic foundation for, for the quantum probability theory. So actually, in 1932, such so one year before the Colombo Gorovs book. So in 50s, Feynman trying to apply the idea to information processing. And our work is kind of motivated by the last, uh, uh, very much motivated by Feynman's work. So, so in what is the quantum probability um, differs? At least one big difference is it is based on the premise that events are represented as subspaces of vector space. And this entails logic, logic of subspaces. And it relaxes a lot of the strict axioms of Boolean logic. So for example, they don't, uh, the events are not always commutative. So what's some psychological reasons for using quanta theory? We believe some of the human cognition decision phenomena at least suggest maybe we need those kind of relaxations. Maybe those Boolean logic and uh, classical probability rules are too uh, restrict. So there are some principles from quantum theory really resonates deeply with, uh, with some psychology intuition and conceptions. And uh, we uh, recently, Jerome um, and I, we finished a special issue for the topics of cognitive science. We presented some phenomena that uh, really represent those ideas. But now I would like to briefly talk about superposition idea and complementarity idea. 
So the superposition idea is very consistent with uh, those uh, deep ambiguity and uncertainty feelings we have in psychology. So suppose that we are jurors trying to judge whether a defendant is guilty or innocent. Then in the classical information processing idea, the question that, well, is this defendant guilty or innocent, works like this. At any moment, you either think it's guilty or innocent. You can change over time. But at every time moment, it's definite. So this is just the Markov model. And uh, in quantum information processing ideas, then, this question is in superpositional. So when you, are, you haven't made the decision yet, you're in superpositional state. So you work something like this. So you always um, had a very ambiguous superpositional state, which this doesn't mean you're in both states. It just means you're neither in guilty nor innocent. Actually, it's a very fundamental uncertainty in determ determinant state until you make the judgment, until you give the answer, you made your decision, then that decision become your state. But before you make decision, you're, you're in a superpositional state. So this uh, quite, um, we find it's very uh, consistent with the feelings we have about ambiguity in psychology decision literature. So the Another idea which I actually uh, I will use in later example of the question order example is the uh, idea of complementarity. Uh, and this is consistent with the constructive view about how we th think about uh, attitude, judgments, those kind of measurements. So for example, if we're trying to understand some emotion we feel that's associated with some physiological arousing situation, then in a classical information processing paradigm, it's something like this. Right, so your cognitive system is in a definite state again with respect to the possible measure. And if you take a measure, whatever <coughs> the measure is, this just simply records what existed immediately before the measurement. So it's a recording process. <coughs> but uh, in a quantum information processing paradigm, then, actually we are in this uh, indefinite still positional state. And we impose those kind of measure which you can create and construct a reality. So it creates a definite state, bring into existence a reality which was not there before. And uh, based on the measurement, based on it's compatible or not, which I will talk about later in my example, the order of measurement also matters. So here I'm going to give a more concrete example of this. So one of the paradoxes, paradoxes that explained by Quinter's theory is the order of measurements matters. And the order effect is not um, just a f existing in physics. It's a very, uh, it's a very per pervasive phenomenon in social and behavioral sciences. For example, the order effect of survey questions has always been a problem in survey research. And uh, the order effects on um, inference for probability judgments and also order effects for conjunction and disjunction fallacies. So there are many different types of order effects. I mean, this, uh, this project works on the order effects of survey questions. So, of course, uh, skeptical such as <laughs> Mr. John uh, Stewart or Professor Jeff Epson would say, well, it seems to me that's still quite a speculative leap to think that quantum theory can be applied to humans simply because they show the effects. And we do agree. And so indeed, to rigorously test our idea, I think we need to de de derive a very quantitative um, prediction about the order effects that can be empirically tested. And in this case, it's a, an a priori parameter free test. So here's an example first of, about the question order effects. So this is um, um, from a paper, similar paper published by David Moore, who was uh, um, president for Gallup for 10 years. So he has been very interested in those kind of question order effects. So he has this paper, and he lists uh, and uh, summarizes a few very interesting question order effects from Gallup research. So in this one, there are 
um, 100 national representative sample, and half the sample, half of the people, will ask, us, "Do you generally think Bill Clinton is honest and trustworthy?" And how about Al Gore? And the other half will ask, us, "Do you generally think Al Gore is honest?" And how about uh, Clinton? So exactly the same question, but in different order: Clinton to Gore and Gore to Clinton. So those are the answers based on the split sample. The, 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 pro, the proportion who said yes, trustworthy. So in this case, Clinton was 50% and 60%. In this case, it was 68 to fix it. So of course, if they knew up front, if they know, please don't give us that order. If they knew those kind of results were going to happen, they would love to administrate those kind of survey in those kind of order because they boosted 8% for Gore, 7% for Clinton. So this in public opinion research is called um, assimilation effects in question order effects because their um, response rate becomes similar in a contextualized situation. So difference when they were asked first, well, 18% between the two but decrease it to 3%, so they become more similar in a contextualized situation. So that's what, uh, what's called assimilation effects in public opinion research. And there are other types of question order effects as well, such as the contrast effects. So this is again, is a Gallup poll in 1995. Again, 1,000 representative sample from the country. And uh, the, basically the question is whether this pollution uh, whether this politician is honest or trustworthy. And uh, in half of the people will ask a new, a new Jim Rich first and Bob Dole. And the other half ask Bob Dole first and new, new Jim Rich. And those are the response rate, what they found. So when, when they were asked uh, first, the, the difference is 41% for Jim Rich and 60% for Bob Dole. When they were asked a second following the other person, it's 64% and 33%. Uh, so, of course, um, if Jim Rich knew this upfront, he wouldn't be happy to be put in this situation. So this is what I call contrast effects because the difference becomes larger. But those are very uh, descriptive, right? So this is what um, the public opinion research has been interested in. So if we look at this uh, auto effects really violates this commutativity rule in classical probability theory, the classical probability theory cannot explain the auto effects because the events are represented as sets and are commutative. So with the sample space, A and B, this part, should be exactly <coughs> equal to this part, B and A. So may I ask a quick yes. question? Yes. Are please. the Hebrew and Gallup poll uh, the same in the two cases? I'm oh. Ask the, uh, oh, thank you very much. So I want to. Sets of questions right. So. Or just the one set. Right. So thank you. That's a great question. So I quickly. So that's what this split sample means. So this is a very very common technique used in national national surveys by Gallup and the Pew many many research companies. So what they do is they have a national representative sample and then they randomly split them into either this uh, condition or this condition. So they have half of this 1,015 people enter in this uh, order, and uh, a random, the random another half in this order. So it's between subjects, but uh, it's a random selection of half-half. So that's what they always do. They, they, they generally know there could be, very likely to be some, could be some order effects, and then generally what they do is to average re the results and report the results to the public. <coughs> yes, thank you. That's great. Yeah. When the same people ask about Al Gore? Sorry? When the same people who ask about New oh. ask about Al Gore? So yes, exactly, the same question. So it's exactly the same question, but two different. Is it the same 1,015 people? Oh, yes, exactly, right. No, so split. Split sample, sample. yes, yes. It's split sample. So they all use this split sample two technique. Two different. Yeah, so it's a split sample means they split the sample into half. So half ask one order, the other half. So half will ask the AB order, the other half will be A order. So that's what a split sample means in public opinion survey. Yes, thank you. 
put them like that. But uh, on later, I will mention actually that map is between or within because I replicate those results in my lamp. So actually, I try both within subject design versus between subject design, and there's all the effects. Um, but that's a great question. Well, May yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Uh, if, uh, you know, maybe maybe you will want to postpone it until it's going better. Yeah. I I I fail to see what is the what is the logic of comparing percentages for first question and second question, rather than between Bob Dole and Bob Dole or no Oh yes, here. very good. So because if you if thank you, you do yeah. Not have so exactly, words, yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, that's a great opinion. Uh, uh, that's a great point here. Actually, uh, in this case. We care about whether there's all the effects or not. But uh, I presented this compared to the when we ask the first versus second. Um, it's consistent with uh, how the public opinion researchers, they, they theorize and conceptualize those ideas, like assimilation effects and the contrast effects. Actually, according to a model I will illustrate in a minute, we, can, we use one single model to explain all these different types <coughs> of uh, Phenomena and they call like different types of order effects, but to us, that's, uh, that's just different parameters in the model. So you, you can have this assimilation effect and contrast effect, right. even if you have no other or no order effect whatsoever. No, correct. Right. No, oh, can't. so what mean? What, what mean? they become yeah. So yeah. the uh, so the key is that, that is right. So the key you is that the response exactly the same numbers 41, 41 and here and sixty. Right. Here, right. And you will have either assimilation or the order, right? I mean, or, or contrast, right? Uh, actually, or they can both go up as well. For example, there are additive effects and subtractive effects, what they call in public opinion research. But our key is that when this, uh, the order of the measurement is asked first or second, people give you a different answer. So those uh, response is not uh, like a fact being retrieved, but it's constructed. So in this case, it's contextualized in this uh, first question. Okay, is that, uh, so is that trying? Yeah, oh, yeah oh, then we have, so do you mean the, uh, the test of the order effects? No, all, all, I, all I was saying that yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense for me to compare this to this. Right, case. right, exactly. But this to comparison right. kind of. Right, right. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Actually, I present in this way is only because trying to link it to what has been done in this field. So what they have, so exactly we care about is this change in the response. Yes, that's a great point. Uh, but the point I want to make a link to this literature in public opinion research is because they propose many different types of question order effects, assimilation, contrast, additive, and so on. But just by a single one model, it is kind of of them. So it's not a very different uh, category, like quantitative different type of effects, in our opinion. You do, so yes. You don't have the data of the, the, what's the frequency of people who say the book. In which is honest, given that a frequency, yeah, yeah, yes. they have said that. Yes, uh, we have. Uh, That's exactly how we use to compute some of the. We have. Yeah, yeah, later you'll see. Yeah, that. so give me one minute. <laughs> yes, we have. That's what we use with using the sequen sequential um, frequency, like sequential probability. Yeah. So, but the point here is that the classical probability theory um, with the commutativity axiom wouldn't expect this to happen. So then let's look at the quantum, <coughs> quantum uh, probability. So events, as I said, are subspaces in a multi-dimensional future space. So technically, uh, an n-dimensional Hilbert space. So, and this is a critical idea, is that the two events, like two measurements, two events, can be compatible or not, or incompatible. So if they're compatible, which means the two events can, can coexist simultaneously without interference. But if they are incompatible, this means they cannot coexist, can coexist. So this compatibility idea is a key, very critical concept in quantum theory. And it's quite interesting, um, it's quite interesting trace in history that actually Bohr in 1928 introduced the concept to quantum, to, to quantum theory. But in fact, 
he was influenced by William James. Actually, William James had this idea first. Um, in his work, in his uh, book in 1890, and uh, Ruben, who is a um, psychologist, who is also a friend and, and fellow student and relative of uh, Bohr, discussed this idea with Bohr, and Bohr liked the idea and imported his idea from psychology to fit, uh, quantum theory. So this actually is very innate in our field in psychology. So if now let's take a look at the, um, if, if we assume those questions, the Clinton and Gore question are compatible, then we need four dimensional Hilbert space. They spanned by four basis vectors. So each vector represents uh, an event. An event of saying yes to Clinton and saying yes to Gore, saying yes to Clinton and saying no to Gore, and no, yes, no. So we need the four dimensional. So we can do it in this way. But in this way, then, it will produce exact probability at classical, as in classical theory. So this will predict no order effects. So there should, shouldn't be. But from our empirical data, but from our empirical data, we know there is order effects. So this doesn't work. So from the order effects, we infer that the measurements are not compatible. So this doesn't work. So we need an incompatible representation of the, of the questions. And this is very consistent with attitude, um, constructive attitude view, such as the work by Norbert Schwartz, who is a social psychologist, so, and many others. So while well, they don't really do much modeling, but uh, they have all this interesting and experimental data showing our attitudes are constructed, attitudes are constructed. And uh, so the idea is that the thoughts constructed from the first question can change the context used for evaluating the second one. So it's very intuitive. And uh, our work trying to do here, what we're trying to do here is trying to provide an elegant way to formalize those kind of intuition. So now here's the quantum model. But before I go to go into illustration, the model I would like to have a disclaimer is that please keep in mind that I use the simplest uh, way I can illustrate the model on a PowerPoint. Um, so it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space with real number. That's as simple as we can get. But the, the QQ model and the, also the test, the QQ test associated with it, apply to any n-dimensional space. So it's not limited to this two-dimensional space. So first, the postul postulate of the model is that the events are subspaces in multidimensional Hilbert space, as we discussed. Um, and uh, so it's something like look like this. And uh, the, this is Cy here is a vector that spans the ray representing the event that is Cy saying yes to Clinton is true. So this is true. So people is going to say yes to Clinton. And the vector of this Cn is a vector that spans the ray representing the event that Cy is false. So you say no to Clinton. And therefore, n a subnormal basis for this two-dimensional space in this example. And then in quantum theory, to represent two incompatible events, the second measurement, in our case, is Gore question. So yes to Gore and no to Gore is a unitary rotation of the first measurement. Then our initial belief is a unit length state vector in a multidimensional feature space. So that's, that's the purple line, ACE. So this initial belief space uh, is quite general because you can interpret this in terms of uh, the Clinton question or interpret this in terms of the Gore question. And this is also a superpositional state, as we discussed. So before you, you have answer to this question, you're, at, you're in a superpositional state. Um, for example, you feel you, you are super, superpositional to the Clinton question, so to both yes and no Clinton question. But you're also superpositional to the Gore question, so yes or no to Gore. So you're on, unresolved yet. You're very uncertain about the question yet. So the prob 
then the probability of selecting a response is uh, the squared length. Is the squared length of the projection of this uh, initial state on the subspace. So, for example, the ray C Y represents the event years to Clinton. Then the probability of selecting this response will be project this belief belief uh, state vector A onto the subspace to say yes to Clinton. And uh, in quantum theory, when you compute, the probability will be square length of this projection. So square length of this, square length of this. And uh, the very similarly, then the ray, if the ray, as we said, this is GY represents the events yes to Gore, then probability to select this response will be projecting this initial belief state onto the subspace GY, say yes to uh, Clinton. And the probability, again, is square length of the projection. So square length of this projection. So you project this to this. Yes. So this is a projector to project this state to this subspace. So now in our example here, in this il illustration here, uh, so we, we intentionally placed uh, those uh, states look like this so we can compute exactly the numbers here. So just to give examples. So then in this example, the probability of saying yes to a Clinton question will be, like we said, will be a squared length of this projection. That's this, which by the number you can read the coordinates, which by the number will be the square of this number, which is 0.7, which means 70% of the probability to say yes to Clinton. And similarly, we know this square length of this projection is 0.96. So this is just uh, one illustration to show when, when Clinton and Gore were asked first, um, Clinton, uh, sorry, Gore is favored, is actually preferred, has a larger probability to, to have a yes answer. So that's consistent with the data. And then in a now comparative context, Gore is favored. But now in a comparative context, so, so one, one thing interesting uh, is now this state, when we project it on, on any subspace, your state is updated as a normalized uh, projection. So for example, in this case, the subsequent question have to evaluate it from this change updated belief. So for example, after saying yes to Clinton question, the belief needs to be updated as a normalized projection. Now it's up updated to A subscript C. So the conditional probability of saying yes to Gore after saying yes to Clinton have to be evaluated from this updated uh, the belief state. So answering this question about Clinton already changed the belief. So that's very intuitive. So to answer the question already, updated uh, change you believe to from here to here. So the, the conditional probability, now we have used this updated uh, um, belief states here to compute the probability, conditional probability to see, uh, of saying yes to a Gore question which in our case, the number comes, up, comes out as 0.5, so it's uh, 50%. And so that's, uh, then similarly, we can compute, how about if Gore was asked first? Now similarly, after saying yes to a Gore, the up, the, it's your initial belief state is updated to a state of uh, Gore. Like after you answer Gore, we, not, uh, we use notation as G here. So the conditional probability of saying yes to a Clinton question now become, again, have to start the, the evaluation belief states from SG instead of ACE. So which is, by our intentional design of this illustration, is 0.5. So now they become similar. So this is just one example to show if they ask us in a now comparative context, now comparative situation, um, <coughs> Gore is preferred. But now when they, ask, they were asking a comparative uh, situation, 
now they become very similar. In our case, it's equal. Yes? Um, I don't understand why this isn't just a conditional probability problem as opposed to being a quantum problem. Oh. So. Well, that, that, that's the data. Conditional probability problem. What do you mean? Well, can, can I ask it in my own terms? And I've used these uh, terms before. What is, what is a quantum here? Oh, superposition Show me state. A quantum. Yeah. So, um, one thing is that the superposition state. Another idea presented in this example is the compatibility idea. So, if uh, they are not comp, if they are so, oh, that's a great question. So, here, if. Uh, if they are compatible, then we can have those um, joint sampling space of the two questions. The, the two, our understanding, whatever evaluation judgment about the two politicians can coexist. So, um, but, but uh, there, there shouldn't be any order effects. But, but now there is order effects. So what is quantum? <coughs> How are you using the term? Because there's a quantum probability. Sorry, axioms. Yeah. So, otherwise, if uh, um, I mean, the physics, there's no quantum physics. Yeah. To give you an example, there's no photons quantum, here. They will have yeah. no problem. So um, we are not talking about physics here. We're just using some of this um, mathematical ideas, principles, as assumptions, like axioms. So we can relax some of some. I think he's asking where are you using mathematical ideas that differ from uh, some of the other structures? We, right. we have, I mean, the, the word Hilbert space is, is, it's a linear vector space. It's a finite dimensional space. Let's not get carried away. Hilbert spaces are normally interesting only when they're infinite dimensional. Yeah. So I think I'll so choose, right. This is just a linear space. We use them a lot. You have selected a basis. It's important to you that this basis has been uh, orthonormalized for your interpretation. But why can't I have any two independent vectors and construct everything about the space? Well, this is four dimensions. Yeah. Four independent vectors. Why right. not? Then there then wouldn't be no order effects. But then from the empirical data, we do have order effects. So this is quite empirically trying to solve this question from this empirical <coughs> data. Does that is that? What's quantum about this is the, the rules the of probability rules are used. Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, in the, in the example that you gave, other than convenience or whatever, why is the probability the squared? Length of a projection. Why is that? Well, you can't. Get, that you can't from? get an additive probability measure unless you do that. So of course you can. No, you can't because that's that's a Gleason's, Gleason's <laughs> theorem. Gleason's theorem does the not apply. You gave a two-dimensional well, example, the, and there are the bucket loads she of said, probability she measures. She said at the beginning that the two-dimensional is just so we can put a picture right, on this screen. Right. So this um, theory is for n-dimensional. So this is just for illustration purpose to put on PowerPoint. So um, indeed, this uh, so in our paper we do present a much more general, and also for the social Q test presented um, later, it's um, it's a much more general mathematical proof, much more general. So but here for illustration idea and the numbers I put here is is not real either. It's just for illustration idea. Does that answer your question? Is that so? I think what's going on here is that we follow those, um, so we have some basic um, quinta concepts here, compatibility and also superposition idea. And uh, for, so it's a, it's a very coherent set of rules we're following, which are working quite uh, in natural with this example here. This is data here, this kind of empirical data we're having. Yes, but the issue is, do these rules conform to Ordinary sort of well, natural yeah. introspection yeah, yeah. and intuition. Oh, I see. I think okay. So she, I'll try to do a better she, job here. Is that uh, well, we okay. so? Data. So actually, I thought this is very compatible, so, but I'm com I already somehow um, took a leap. So to me, this is very intuitive. 
Actually, for example, um, this, uh, for example, this, uh, for example, I think it's very unnatural to think that when when ask the judgment about, uh, for example, Clinton or Gore, is some memory retrieval. I don't believe so. Actually, I'm much more with those social psychology like uh, Nobel Shores. I think it's constru constructed with the limited capacity of our mind. I don't think it's uh, efficient to save all these opinions about the world in our brain or whatever mind. But instead, I constructed them. And if you ask me about my gender, my age, age now it's more constructed. But for gender, it's uh, it's uh, so efficient to save them just in my mind. So, for example, if you ask me my race and uh, gender, I don't think there will be all the effects because because it's uh, it's the retrieval of the memory instead of uh, constructors' uh, attitude. Yes, I have their hands there. Sorry. If I could just try to focus in on the question that was being asked. You're saying that classical probability and middle order events. Classical probability is full of order events. I, I, you must be saying something different. But I well, in this, in this case here, you would have the classic probability would be the probability that Clinton says yes and Gore says yes, conditioned on Clinton saying going first. Right, so you That's have a separate sample space. So we're trying space. to explain that data. You'd have to have a, a probability separate. distribution when Clinton went first right. and then a separate probability distribution when Gore right. went first. And what we're trying to do is build one theory that combines, that applies to both of those distributions. So if you, if you want to say you can build a classic probability distribution that is exactly the data, that's not interesting. What we're trying to do is build a probability that maps to both of those orders. Yeah. So actually, you can you can have cost model for this, yeah, yeah. but then you condition, but you have to construct uh, two sample space here. So you kind of have a same sample space, and um, so because if you have the same sample space for the two condition two order, the a and b and b and a should be the same. But now, if in the classical probability you will need uh, one sum space for the Clinton Gore order and another sum space for the Gore and Clinton. Well, that's what Jeff was right. saying. He used conditional probability. Yeah, but, but, then, but that's just the data. What we're trying to do is explain. You, if you, if you want to say you can build a classical model for that, yes, you can do that. But now what we're trying to do is build a model that explains that, because that's just the data. That just describes the data. Okay. Just and uh, um, well. We better move on because. Okay. You're never going to get to Okay, the so I will take some questions <laughs> later, maybe. Yeah. So, um, so of course, all the, we can come up with many, many wonderful orders and uh, uh, models, and uh, maybe the final is the competition of the model, and we do have other work trying to compete the classical model with uh, a lot of uh, quantum model and see how, how they, which works better. Okay, so just to come up with this, actually, the, um, so, okay. So, to sum up, the, in this, uh, so this is kind of very, in a, in a very, very simple way, actually, very simple way. Explain why the probability of response differ when people ask first, when they will ask a second. In the Clinton-Gore and Gore-Clinton, so because the, um, the dependence of the sequence of the, of the measurements in this case. So if you, so yeah. So, but, but still, yes, exactly, so one challenging is well, you can explain uh, how to reproduce the Tesla's idea. And um, so this is actually we uh, indeed be able to, we are, we are able to, to derive uh, something we call QQ equality. So, well, if you in the proof is in the paper, but um, basically, simply speaking, is that uh, uh, in one order, when people say yes to the question A and then no to question B plus, the probability the person say no to A and yes to B in one order should be equal to they say yes to B and then no to A and no to B and then yes to A in the other B A order. So basically, these two parts should be equal. So that's what we call QQ equality. This part in one order, you, what you can observe in one order should equal to the other. So those are very, this is observed data. So answer the question bef like we had at the beginning of the talk, those are um, like sequential probabilities. Yes, we observe from the data, from the data. So then the, well, that's what we call Q test is the difference of the two should not be significantly from zero. 
So this uh, test is dimensional free. Again, it's dimensional free. It's down restricted to the simple example here. It's dimensional free. It can be very arbitrarily large and dimensional. And it's parameter free because this has to be equal to this. There's no, esti no estimation of parameter here. And uh, it has to be exact. So it has to be 0 and it's a prior. So it kind of depends on um, how many dimensions. kind of depends on what's the type of questions and so on. So here's a test, some initial tests we did. So, so that's kind of one purpose. Uh, we, I try to show, for example, um, what people call consistence, but assimilation effects, contrast effects, additive and subtractive type of effects in public uh, opinion research. And uh, those are the data that have been used as classical examples in public opinion research to show those kind of order effects. And, uh, this uh, simple, very simple QPO model actually can account for those all kinds of different types of uh, order effects. So the first one is, uh, so the first column here is uh, the Klinger and Gore question that I just ex explained. And here, the last uh, a few three rows are the Q, the Q number, as defined in the previous page. This Q number, the difference between this uh, sum of the probability in the two orders. So we predict that this should not be significantly from different from zero. So those are z-test and chi square test for this um, um, hypothesis. And this is a number. I just make it larger so we can see. So this is the data, the all observable data from the scale of the pool. And uh, apparently, <coughs> the Q is surprisingly small. It's not significantly, so it's not significantly different from zero. So it's zero. By the way, that's the chi square, not the p value. Yeah, this is the chi square, chi square value for the chi square test for this model. So yes. Is the assumption that all of the respondents are coming from the same representation? So that's a good question. So this uh, th that's a good question. So when Gallup and Pew, those research centers, they do those huge, large national surveys, they have very careful sampling procedures, make sure it's very representative, national representative. That, so which means they are very representative nationally. And also, they randomly split the sample. So the two half of samples should not be, there are no reason to think they differ from each other. So that's what has been uh, extreme effort has been put into those kind of uh, both will situations. Have a mix of Democrats and Republicans. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah right, 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 definitely, definitely. So, um, okay, then we get the second is the Jim Rich and Bob Doerr question I just showed, and again the number is extremely slow, and again the QQ equality is supported. So the Q test is very small, and actually in this case we get very the same tiny numbers. So um, actually, Jerome and I, we were getting the data from, from David Moore, who was the Gallup poor president at the time, one by one, because they have dig out the file and find out the data. And uh, we wonder, wow, this is really great. But we are also worried, is there anything, something wrong? So actually, we are happy to get a third, third data set, and which, again, the QQ equality is supported. But, um, but the number is different. Q number is different, but it's still not significantly different from zero. So the Q equality still holds. And uh, this is a question is a white and black question. Uh, it, so people will ask it, how do you think uh, white people is a white people hostile to black? And uh, the other question is, do you think black people is hostile to white? So they ask the white hostility and the black hostility in one half of the sample and then black hostility and white in the other half. So white and black, yes. It, the Q suggests there's no order effect, but the data you showed looked like there oh. was an order effect. Sorry, so this is a QQ test. It test our model. The QQ, <laughs> our so order. from our, sorry. I, this may be a good question. So this may become clearer when I show my new data set. Actually, the test on the order is significant. So these significant order effects are in all these data sets. But this QQ is a test uh, whether our model oh. is right, the model I represent. So the QQ equality is um, our model to explain the question order effects. So, and it's, um, it has to be exactly to be this part equal to this part. Oh, their difference is zero. 
thank you for giving me a chance to uh, clarify that. I, I thought this is the cute name, but maybe that uh, somehow interfered with the idea about question order. So, and finally, um, this, the, the last data set from David Moore was um, um, Peter Rose, who is a, ba a baseball player, and um, surely it's uh, Joe Johnson, who is a base well, no, I, well, first player. Yeah, but from twenties, uh, twenties. So, probably well before everybody was born here. So, I'm not sure if you're a baseball fan, probably you're familiar with them. So. And uh, so in this case, actually, what, uh, so what they were, the question Well, do you think Peter Rowe, so both of them played some games, like uh, gambling, and uh, they lost uh, some of the, the, um, uh, their chance to get into the, the, the whole fan of baseball. And uh, the question asked, well, do you think they should still be, you know, be nominated for the um, whole fan of baseball? What do you think about um, the Rose, what do you think about Peter Rose? What do you think about um, um, Joe, Joe, Joe Johnson? Jackson. Joe Jackson. Joe Johnson, he was a student. Sorry. <laughs> and I said, oh. Okay, so, yeah, surely it's Joe Johnson from, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, um, so actually, when we get this data set, so we just uh, will naturally plug the number into a model, and uh, this will blow us out of the water. Now, Although the Q number is still small, but actually it's significantly different from zero. So this, uh, this doesn't support the model. Then, but actually when we look at the data, what exactly the question we are asked actually is become supportive to what we were thinking. Because um, again, Peter, um, Peter Rose was a player in 70s and 80s. So people are more familiar with uh, this player. So there was a no background information was provided about the player, but uh, um, Joe Jackson was uh, someone from 20s. So the um, Gallup research has to have a very lengthy description about oh what uh, he did, what uh, did he lost, give a lot of information about him, and then ask, do you think he should be in the Hall of Fame? So this actually by our model should change the belief state by giving that information. So it's in this, um, so in this, uh, for example, A, B order. It's not uh, the person initial from the initial belief and the project in the first question and to a certain question instead. It's a project to the first question and then to the background information and then to the second question. <coughs> so actually by our model, this is should, this equal equality should not, should not hold for this uh, uh, Joe, Joe Jackson question. So actually, in the other way, actually, exactly show. Um, so we are happy. We are actually happy to see the Q test done holds in this case because it shouldn't. So it's highly testable. It's not something not testable. And then I replicate some similar type of question identified in the public uh, public opinion research, which always used national survey. But I replicate those questions. Uh, using between subject design, within subject design in the research lab. So I have more control about what's going on, who they are, and so on. And uh, they, they always support the QQ equality. So we will have more confidence about the idea. So now, actually, we have some new empirical testing on this model as well using a larger data set. And it's cool. So this is uh, some new empirical data from Pew Research Center, again, using split sample, national representative sample. So uh, with a f in this case, it's uh, 1,500 people. And uh, half of people will ask, uh, do you approve the way Obama is handling his job as president? Now, are you satisfied with the way things are going in this country today? And the other half of the sample will ask, are you satisfied with the way things are going in this country? But uh, how do you think about the, the president? So for example, those are the Numbers, yes. Say the dependent variable is do you approve of Obama? Mm. Oh. On, on the left side, the, the independent variable is nothing has happened before. The, 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 the poll taker hasn't said anything. On the right side, replace that top question with the poll taker coming in and saying, boy, the newspapers report 
that most Americans aren't satisfied. Mm -hmm. So that first, that top right question isn't a measurement, but, but oh, code, coded as an independent yeah. variable. Yeah, right. So, so wouldn't you want to hmm. say, do I get a different cross effect when I replace a measurement yeah. with yeah. The information? Fact? Yeah. Yes, actually, I believe so. Actually, theoretically, I totally believe so. Actually, the measurement totally, I think, is just a way for you to resolve that uncertainty either by self measurement. It's like the essence of your motivation right. is precisely that you're taking two measurements right. of, of something where the, the measurement order. Right. Right. So, interpretation. Right. Exactly. It's just independent variables. So I'm saying. Right. So, flip it. Flip it to an independent variable that's related. Right. But isn't a measurement. That's yeah. good. Cool. So I guess it's up to up to you to define what measurement is. For example, by reading well, a news. The question, the question is right. a measurement. No, no, no. Right. It, say, exactly. No. Telling you what the newspaper said isn't a measurement. Actually, uh, we actually not in this paradigm. No, there's no question mark at the end. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good, but maybe you have self measurement. For example, you read the newspaper. I agree, disagree. Actually, okay. I was thinking what I feel. In that case, what wouldn't be a measurement? That's a great question. That's a very hard question. I have some opinions, but I'm going to skip that here. Literally at the that's dinner table. Question. That's a wonderful question. But that's what I believe is that measurement can be. Um, had to, I think, uh, fundamentally, it had to resolve some uncertainty you, you have about some issue, either because yourself was thinking what I feel today without being prompt. Yeah. I'll answer the question. I think the measurement yeah. is that the subject is resolving the poll taker's uncertainty. Right, right, right. Yeah. Interesting. That's a great point. Um, it's good. Actually, we do have an experiment trying to test the given the information versus the asking for the information. Good. Yeah. Okay. It's a different paradigm. OK. So, and of course, yeah, yes. yeah so, so actually this is a test of the order effects and the QQ equality. So, so in this case, those are the observed proportions, for example, for, 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 for in the order, president was asked first in the country, and in the other order, country and president. So we have those uh, observed proportions in the two different orders. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a simple uh, chi-square test. So the null hypothesis is that they should not differ. But then there is significant order effects. So you can do those, we do those uh, order, if, make sure there's order effects. And then we do the QQO equality. This is simple again, getting the, um, it's simply computed uh, as I showed in previous steps. So again, in this case, there is a significant order effect, but the QQO equality that's, um, let's use to test our model uh, is holds, is supported. So it's not significant different from zero. So the QQ equality holds. So, but, it, but this is one example, but is this a robust order effect? So I think a hard test on this is that uh, if this uh, kind of question is asked over time for two different populations, hopefully we can get a more robust uh, evidence on this. So this has been done um, over a year, in the past year. So we <coughs> do work with the Pew and uh, collect all the data from Pew in the past 10 years on this two pairs, on this uh, one pair question. So sometimes actually they do not ask, um, um, they don't, do not ask in the split sample, so we have no way to test it. So but identify, we identified 26 surveys that exactly look like the, the way I just showed. So there is a representative sample, and uh, the sample will split, and half will ask A, B, half will ask B, A order. And uh, we identified 26 uh, survey, and the uh, sample range from 800 people to more than 3,000 people in this country. So this figure shows uh, a summary about the chi-square test and the QQ test, the chi-square for the QQ test. So the Levy bar here. Blue. Oh, le blue, Levy, blue. Levy blue, yeah. I feel uncertain about that. but. <laughs> so for the blue parts here, um, this shows the chi-square, the distribution of the chi-square for testing the order effect, what is the order effect or not. Um, of course, the 10 categories by the night decentile of distribution. So it's the distribution of the chi-square among the respondents, among the 26 um, surveys to test the order effects. And the green bars 
shows the chi-square test for testing the cubic equality. So the so we use both chi-square to test the order effects and the cubic equality. And um, and this uh, dotted line is the expected the frequency, which is 2.6, if the null hypothesis is true. So null hypothesis is that uh, um, this node effects and the, this is not different from zero. And this R, so across all the 26 surveys we identified, so the observed frequency distribution of all the effects, so the blue bars significantly differs from the expected frequency. So, it's a, so this distribution significantly differ from this uh, uniform distribution here, if the null hypothesis is the case. But um, the distribution of the QQ core in the blue bars is not. So again, um, we found a significant order effect across the 26 surveys. And there is no significant uh, violation of the QQ equality we predicted based on the model. So we can actually use the same very general model, not the mode, model to explain many other phenomena, such as all the effects on inference for probability judgment and all the effects for conjunction and disjunction fallacies as well. Exactly the same idea <coughs> can be explained for many different phenomena. So Jennifer and Jerome had a paper in Coke Sign is used um, um, a quantum model explains um, probability judgment and all the effects, and also a cycle review paper by Buzma and uh, Jennifer and others explain the conjunction and disjunction fallacy order effects. So the idea is that the very, to me, I think it's a very surprisingly accurate prediction. I think I haven't um, had the opportunity to see other now par like parameter-free tests in social and behavior science. It's extremely hard for social, <coughs> social behavior science to have param parameter-free. We also feed model and feed uh, parameters and um, so in this case, is, I'm pretty happy about this um, prediction. And this is just uh, one application example of um, an accumulating body of evidence supporting the general ac applicability of quantum theory to explain our cognition and decision. And uh, this, as I said, very general set, very coherent, very simple a set of axioms can be used uh, to explain many phenomena, many different types of order effects of phenomena, but also like memory test, uh, there are some violation of the choosing principle, for example, uh, <coughs> violation of dis di distance axioms and over and under extension effects of the membership judgment and over distribution of absolute memory and so on. So um, we do have a special issue coming out soon. and. Uh, um, if you're interested, please check them out. So I think there are a, large, um, a larger and larger group of people are working on those kind of phenomena now. So, so quantum probability is a coherent theory that generalizes. <laughs> no, it's, it's up for conversation and debate. I figured out that at the lunch table today. <laughs> uh, there are different opinions. <laughs> Generalized classical probability, at least in, from some perspectives, and introduces the concept of incompatible. So in this case, it shows this uh, concept about incompatibility and compatibility idea, and uh, uh, and which, uh, by the way, is rooted in psychology. And now I think it's interesting to introduce it back to psychology again. And quantum probability theory provides a very variable way to model probabilistic and dynamic uh, uh, human cognition decision. And right following my talk, um, Jerome Busmeyer will talk about dynamic, some dynamics of this um, decision. And <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> <laughs> so in a commentary uh, from Professor Nering um, to our special issue, he used a very strong word saying, oh, this is just an alien to psychology. But uh, I feel they are not. <laughs> <laughs> They're right down to earth. It's very intuitive. Um, maybe it's a personal bias, but once I get it, I feel it's very intuitive to me, quite consistent with some intuitions we have. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes? If I give you, uh, take your two-dimensional example. I give you 
uh, two subspaces. Can you tell me, and I can define them, can you tell me whether they are incompatible or not? That's a great question. So actually, that's uh, some question I've been thinking about uh, as well. So so far, so we do have some psychology ideas about what can be compatible and incompatible. For example, I don't think the question about the gender and uh, um, so to some people age is incompatible because maybe psychologically there is used to have them coexist somehow in our cognition, whatever you define cognition. So when so they will not interfere, so they can coexist in your in your mind in the sample space. So you have a joint distribution of both. But uh, if you ask me about Clinton and Gore or what I think about the president and uh, the country, then it's something I construct. So they, by by the psychology ideas, probably is constructed. In other case, they are they can interfere with each other. So we don't have a joint distribution about what's the probability for me to say I, how much I like Obama and how, how, how much I think this country is doing great. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's a great question. And because uh, so far, what we can do is uh, quite empirically saying, OK, all the effects are occurs, then which also suggests there should be, for example, um, some we have come up similar ways to test whether the measurement also um, can. So actually, we do have some tests right now we develop, make this even prior testable. So in a way, for example, we can have, instead of one pair, have three questions. Then we ask, uh, given the data about the pairs of the three questions, then we can exactly predict what could happen to the third pair, for example. So, that's a, so there are a lot of work need to be done along those ways to have much what more I, what prediction I'm getting ideas. At is this. Suppose you're, you're, you're teaching this new quantum uh, cognition I, to a group of students. And sorry, one of them I, goes off and decides to model some phenomenon. What, how, does, how does your theory, so you're a good teacher, how does your theory instantiate itself without making arbitrary decisions? It's How does the student say, ah, oh, well, it's a good question. I need various incompatible subspaces, right. and yet, so, right. So it's great. So in my opinion, uh, unfortunately, I feel like any model starts with some assumptions. And I, in my opinion, I feel this even have less assumptions, relax some axioms, for example. So because I don't assume compatibility in this case, compatibility well, here. Clinton and Gore be incompatible? Because the data shows. So in this no, case, you I'm sorry. you haven't collected the data. Right. You're interested right. in these issues. Right, right, And you plan an so, experiment, but you haven't right. seen any data. Right. How do you know so if, they're in, in Right. Data? So if I'm, my student wants to do that, I would uh, suggest, do you have good reasons to believe so? So for example, if the person is working with uh, uh, Patty, <laughs> Patty doesn't believe the, um, um, the attitude is uh, constructed. So he could have different uh, idea about <coughs> this could happen or not happening and have some other explanation about it. But if, if uh, for example, I believe in um, the test about the constructive nature of attitude, then I think it's quite uh, safe to assume this. Mm -hmm. And again, and another idea is, um, yeah, sorry. Well, you had a slide to, to, I think that might help answer Jeff's question, yeah. which is a very good question, by the way. Yeah. But, so we have, to, we have independent ways of determining whether they're incompatible. So one is kind of a, a Heisenberg. <coughs> do you have that slide? Which? You know, where you show the different ways of determining incompatibility. You had three ways. I think we had three ways. Well, it. actually, it's One your difference. Is the, when you, can do a, you, can, you can do a test of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So you, I didn't include you this know, decreasing one. The variance, one variable should increase the variance of the other variable. So we get some kind of a inequality on the product of the variances. And with, then the other way would be order effects. Or a third way would be, for example, our explanation for conjunction, disjunction fallacies has to depend upon incompatibility. So, like for example, if you get a conjunction fallacy, we must assume they're incompatible. So then, we then if we do an order order effect test, we better find order effects. Or if we get a Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, 
that would indicate to us they're incompatible. Then we should find order effects when we do an order mm -hmm. effects test. But let's right. Right. So be very concrete and go back to the two-dimensional example. And, and let, let's just look at that. Isn't it the case in this particular simple example that all, OK, there's a two-dimensional space, the whole thing, OK? Let's one subspaces, proper subspaces are one dimensional. In are case, they not yeah. pairwise, all incompatible? Yeah, I mean, every so time every, you, every time you, every, every idea that's different or every individual yeah, yeah. different in from two, Clinton two, every two is incompatible with they Clinton. They have to all be, yeah, because you're Every rotating. one of them. Yeah, because you're rotating around that space. They would well, all have to be incompatible. See, that's where my intuition well, but we don't, fails. But we don't, I, I we don't, don't want to use a two-dimensional space. We don't, this is just the only thing we can plot on a, on a screen. So we imagine the space is n-dimensional. It's, it's like this n-dimension has to represent all your knowledge about any question you want to ask. You can ask a Clinton question. I can ask about John F. Kennedy's marital relationship. Or I can ask about you know, the Hadrian's Wall and when it was built. This state vector that we're talking about here has to answer all those questions. Yes. So it can't be a two-dimensional vector. It's got to be a high-dimensional vector. But the vector. notion of a subspace is a geometrical one, yeah, and right. it is independent of any basis. Yeah, I know. So, I mean, so the, the projectors don't commute. It, with the project, each subspace is corresponding to projectors. They don't commute. So you can put up your subspaces. We can define the projectors. They don't commute. And, and again, almost any no matter what the dimension is, almost any issue that you are willing to uh, investigate is going to involve incompatible subspaces. Well, you can have compatible subspaces too. Like she's, you can but have some, are, some of them can be. But they're relatively I mean, trivial. You can have many, you can have in a high dimensional space, a lot of the questions can be compatible. And a lot of the questions can be incompatible. There's, there's, I don't know how many compatible questions are computer. Like in physics, you've got position on x coordinate and y coordinate, they're compatible. Yeah. And, and if you have a lot of particles, there's a lot of compatible. Uh, I'm a bit surprised. Uh, can't you have two Fermatian operators in two by two that commute, that are commuted? Of course you can. Uh, why should they be trivial? Mm -hmm. you, can always, you can always have pairs of operators that are commuted. Yeah. And pairs of operators that are not. A priori, they do not know that because uh, compatibility is just a special case of incompatibility. All they do is mm -hmm. just do not assume compatibility. Right. And if they get right. certain results that right. indicate so, they involve right. the possibility of right. incompatibility. Right. And uh, you know, for meeting operators can commute or may not commute, right? All you are certain that they do not have to commute. And then you use this possibility to explain empirical data. Uh, I'm not completely sure what what this kind of big philosophical yeah. problem is around. That. Right. Actually, you don't well, assume. to take your example, yeah. it, it shows that in two dimensions, yes, commuting permission operators are one and the same. They have to share an eigenvector, right? And there's only one other eigenvector which is orthogonal to the shared one, and they have the same. They're the same. So in two dimensions. Yeah, we don't. The two dimension it, is not a realistic right? model. It's yeah. only a picture. Yeah. 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 We so never would. We would never so use a two dimensional model as a real model. You know, right. if you're going to put on a blockbuster, show me a good picture. You know. Well, we can't. Yeah. We we have in the Psych Review paper we have a three dimensional <sighs> model. Yeah. That's a harder picture, but then people can't see things. Right. As well. Right. So let's compromise, but great question. Thank you. We'll move on.